So I was commissioned in June of 66. So I was assigned to the USS Mullifin, AKA 61. It was a World War II vintage ship that um, used the old fashioned boom and crane system to lift, uh, to lift tanks and trucks out of the hold. And we carried on top of the hatch covers um, these big Mike boats. They were used at Normandy, Mike 6s they were called. So the, they were amphibious boats with the, with the um, uh, front ramp, much like the classic Higgins boat, that the, but a bigger version. In fact, we had six Higgins boats, plywood Higgins boats on the ship, uh, exactly like the ones used at Normandy. And it was so hot, the ship was not air conditioned, um, that I, I slept out on a cot virtually the whole time until we got back to North Carolina. And then I got orders to the USS Ricketts. It was the fifth of the Adams-class ships that were built in the 60s. They were state-of-the-art missile destroyers, and our main job was part of the Sixth Fleet. And my first job was uh, navigation. In those days, once you got even 300 miles off the east coast of the United States, navigation was 19th, or 17th century nav navigation. Everything was chronometer, sextants. There was no electronic navigation other than using your radar when you were in close and you had a shoreline that you could use. And as we were coming into the Azores, I can vividly remember um, uh, the Commodore turning to me. We had eight hours of fuel left on board, which is like a jet, jet liner with a few minutes of fuel left on board when you're a ship, and saying, son, you better have the right island here. But we did get to the right place. We got refueled. Our next stop was the Balearic Islands. And I'll never forget going into um, the Mediterranean or approaching the Mediterranean. I was up at the bridge. Again, we're doing all of our navigation really the old fashioned way with a sextant. So not like today when you can, you know, exactly where you are with a satellite. Looking at the radar screen, which is a big round black and at night with no targets, it's just a black screen. Looks like a TV screen that, that went black. And, and then suddenly up at the top, there started the paint, the shorelines, Gibraltar on one side and uh, Morocco and Casablanca on the other side. And lo and behold, as we got closer, it just painted a picture just like your geography book. And of course, uh, thankfully, we're headed right for the center of the slot. <laughs> With only about 30 months in the Navy, I got spot promoted to uh, lieutenant, which is um, like a captain in the Army, because I, they, you know, the captain made me the anti-submarine officer, and that was a lieutenant's billet, so he's able to promote me uh, to a lieutenant. And with that came responsibility for um, the two nuclear weapons we had on board. I don't think people realized, but uh, back in those days, uh, we had two nuclear depth charges, which we could use as a last resort if we couldn't, if we couldn't get the submarine with a torpedo. I'm not sure it had to go all the way to the president to use nuclear weapons because these were underwater nuclear weapons. But we had a, um, a fail-safe system on the ship, so uh, there had to be uh, a key inserted both on the bridge and down in uh, weapons control, which is where I was for, for, at, at, at general quarters for ASW. So down where you had the sonar displays and the computers that controlled the weapons, uh, you had to have um, what they call the green board two, um, and it had to be up on the bridge. And then the bridge, he had to insert a key there and turn it, much like starting a car, and we had to have a key down and turn it. So, you, no single, the idea was that no single person could um, fire the weapon and that it required the captain to, the captain had possession of the keys and they were locked away. The weapons had to be under 24-7 physical guard. So the weapons, we had a magazine and that magazine, even at sea, which was kind of incredible, they had to post a physical guard outside the magazine. So, there, yeah, the, the security was uh, unbelievable. And the inspections were, I can't even tell you about the inspections they gave you. The Russians had a large presence in the Mediterranean. They had uh, surface ships and submarines. They had a lot of uh, snoopers. These were trawler type vessels that monitored the Sixth Fleet, uh, trying to gain intelligence through electronic surveillance mainly and, and, and visual. 
and, and, the, and the Russians were constantly overflying the Mediterranean with their big bear, I think they called them bear bombers. So, um, and this was kind of the height of the Cold War, you're talking about uh, the mid, late 60s. Um, and there was a, a kind of a, a standoff. So yeah, that, our job was to try to keep track of the Russian submarines and, um, and obviously have a deterrent effect. I mean, as you recall, everything was deterrent. So the aircraft carrier at that time had nuclear bombs on board, the, the big ones, that, that if something were to happen, they were part of the um, nuclear deterrent. So it was a pretty, uh, pretty important uh, assignment. The last ship I was on was the um, USS Larson. It was a late World War II destroyer. Came, uh, it, it served uh, in the last year or so of the war. And uh, it was a gunship. We had six five-inch barrels, so we had three twin mounts. And I finished up with a little over four years of active duty. I did stay in the Naval Reserve. Of course, being in the Washington area, there was um, uh, a Naval Reserve unit that I joined and we supported the um, merchant marine side of the Navy called the Military Sea Lift Command. These are Navy ships that are not designated USS, they're NSS, or N they're designated as a Naval or US ship. They're manned by uh, American merchant mariners and they provide all the logistics and over time they become uh, the Navy uh, shifted from commission ships as oilers and, and ammunition ships to these um, civilian man ships. So our unit supported them. I did a lot of projects with them um, and I rose up in rank to become a captain and uh, commanding officer of the unit. We had over 60 officers because we manned ports all around the world. And my last year uh, after the command, I was assigned to the historical unit, which supports the Navy Historical Center at the Navy Yard, which is itself very historical, dates back to before the Revolution or to the Revolution. And uh, with the Historical Center, um, I was sent for my active duty, my two weeks, to Subic Bay because they were closing the base. The base uh, became an American base during the Spanish-American War. It was a Spanish naval base. The Americans got it. It was taken away by the Japanese in World War II. We got it back, and it became a huge base during Vietnam. So we had a wonderful time um, interviewing all of the officers from the admirals on down. We interviewed shipyard workers who were there before the Japanese came, and were still there. We collected as many plaques and uh, mementos as we could, flags and, and other things. So that was a very interesting sort of end of my, my Navy career. I think the Navy gave me a, a good foundation of uh, what, what it means to be a responsible adult. And then from there, uh, when I went into the business world, I had um, you know, four years of, of experience dealing with people, um, making things happen, making decisions, all of these things. Obviously, business, particularly the apparel business, uh, didn't have a lot of direct relationship to the kinds of decisions, but the whole process of, of how you effectively manage, whether it's a, a ship or a, a company, um, uh, have a lot of similarities. Like so many things in life, you know, some things leave you with um, uh, a good taste and some things, um, you'd rather forget. And um, I, I'm constantly thinking about all the good times that we had um, um, in the Navy.